Welcome into Honorado and Bagnardi. Chris Honorado, Sean Bagnardi. We're live on location. Give you one guess. Where are we, Bags? We are at the home of our title sponsor. There it is. Alpenhouse. In Amsterdam, and we are so pumped to be here. It's a beautiful day. We're going to have a lot of activity, people coming in to pick up their RVs and trailers. Alpenhouse is absolutely slammed with the pool requests already into 2022, but they will try to fit you in this year. If you're looking for a, for a pool in your backyard, give them a shout. Uh, they have been good to us. We know they'll even be better uh, to you. All right, Bags, a lot to get to on the show here. I have really been enjoying, quite frankly, the Boo Fest that's going on in the Bronx lately. I hope it continues. As you know, I'm not a Yankees fan, but man, I hope it continues the way the fans are finally getting a chance to serenade the Astros. We had another no-hitter last uh, uh, Wednesday night in Major League Baseball. Can't wait to dive into that and who exactly is John Means and what's up with all these no-hitters in baseball. And then what's up with your Mets? They can hit. But before we get into any sports, man, we got something bigger. This is your last day of freedom. Wow. You are going to be a married man in a little bit more than 24 hours, Chris. Yeah. And by the way, you're, we're celebrating that with a cougar behind us. Did you notice that? <laughs> but this is it, man. This is it for you. Congratulations on the wedding to you and Ashley. Everybody who knows you guys wishes you the best. That includes all of our supporters here with Honorado and Bagnardi, and of course, myself. Yeah. Well, thank you, buddy. With that, let's get this thing rolling. We've got Kelly Cruel from Bally Sports South, who covers the Hawks and the Braves. Of course, Kevin Herter, Ian Anderson. We'll talk with Kelly coming up on the show. Let's get it going. Honorado and Bagnardi. This is Honorado and Bagnardi. Brought to you by Alpen House. All right, Bags, we said it there in the open. The Yankees fans have finally gotten their chance to get after the Astros a little bit. It didn't happen at all last year. But now that Houston is in the Bronx and was this past week, Yankees fans have really let Altuve and Bregman, uh, they've really let them hear it. And quite honestly, I've been enjoying it. I hope we get more of it. I hope it continues even beyond this year. Uh, and I have no real strong association with the Yankees at all, but I'm enjoying the the grudge that is be, that has become Yankees Astros. Well, me too, man. And look, it's obviously justified, right? I mean, a lot of times it's hard, not that it's hard to get into a certain kind of rivalry if it isn't one of your favorite teams involved, but doesn't this just feel like all of Major League Baseball should be against the Houston Astros? And like, at least for this kind of series, like we're all Yankees fans. If you're not an Astros person, you're behind the Yankees on this. Now, some might say the booing isn't enough. Of course, that's all the fans can do. Uh, would you like to see some more is my question to you. Well, I would have liked to have seen more in the moment. Now it's too late. Rob Manfred, the commissioner, missed his chance, and, and he handled it about as poorly as you could handle any gate, right? I mean, any sign-stealing scandal, uh, even Roger Goodell did more to the beloved Patriots and Bill Belichick. Even, even Belichick and Kraft and the Patriots were, were levied more of a punishment than the Houston Astros were. I don't want to hear about draft picks or <clears throat> fines really when it comes to Major League Baseball and a championship team. And I don't care that they had to fire their manager and GM. I, that does nothing for me. This was done on the field by the players. An MVP was won by Jose Altuve, a guy who was stealing signs in a very elaborate manner. I understand it happens across Major League Baseball, basically in every single clubhouse. But this went another level to me that needs to be cracked down upon. It did, but I wasn't even talking about is it enough for you in terms of the punishment aspect. I'm talking about don't you want to see guys just get drilled? No. I mean, look, the fans haven't forgotten – and neither have the ball clubs or neither should the ball clubs have forgotten what the Astros did. I know we had – it was weird last year because it's like there was this long gap between and now it feels like, well, maybe it's too late to really get the retribution. The fans can go out there and boo and that's it. But 
I want to see more, man. I mean, look, I'm not – I've never been a fan of – we settle it on the field because we're baseball and we're going to hit a guy if we're mad about something. But if there was ever a time to sort of strike back in an on the field kind of way, don't you just, isn't Altuve just the kind of guy you want to see get beamed, man? Isn't he? Doesn't he have that face now? I don't know. Look at Bregman's face there. I think a lot of Yankees fans would agree he's got the face of a guy who should be thrown out a little bit. And DJ LeMahieu gets hit Wednesday night uh, in a game and it was up and in. I- I'm with you. I'm not somebody who who champions the Gobina guy for the sake of it as like retribution. So to me, hey, go win the game. Let the fans have fun with it. Giancarlo Stanton's getting hot for the Yanks. I'm I'm past the let's throw at a guy type of thing. If, if that were going to happen, it should have happened last year, not necessarily this year. This year, it's about the fans getting their chance to really give it to the Astros. All right. Look, I get it. I just want to see these guys. There's nothing more iconic from – you know, the shots that we saw, then Altuve coming home, right, and and covering up the jersey. And it's like, that to me will just stand out as such an injustice that we never really got to see yep. justice served. And, and it's disappointing, man. It's disappointing as a fan of the game. Look, we've been through, fans our age have been through a lot of bad kind of baseball or bad PR for baseball, really through the whole steroid era. I mean, that... That took a lot of fans away from the game, and it took baseball a long time to, I think, earn back that reputation. I mean, look, we had the strike in, what, 94? 94, and it right. took some time to build back from that, and everybody said, well, it was the home run race in 98 with Sosa and McGuire that really brought fans back to the game? And then it's like, well, that wasn't even legitimate for us because they were probably both juicing. We know that McGuire was. Sosa at least had a corked bat. Come and then on. you had the whole era of steroids. You had Barry Bonds. And and it's like just when baseball, for me, felt like it was starting to get its reputation back. And, and I was one of those fans who really kind of departed from the game a little bit because of that stuff. And then was coming back. And, and, and it's like all of a sudden, here's this another scandal. And it's another one tied to cheating. It's another one that tells you what you saw on the field was not legitimate. And that was disappointing. So because baseball didn't do enough, I just feel like I'm unfulfilled in wanting to see somebody do something. And yeah, the fans can boo. That's great. It still feels like an injustice for me and something that's not fulfilled as a fan to really get back at these Astros. And I don't know that we'll see it at all between the Yankees and Astros this year. I I don't know that New York will be in a position where they feel like they've got a game in hand. And so let's go hit Bregman or Altuve or if it's, you know, the last meeting of the year. And and that's kind of the note they want to go out on is is to hit one of these guys. My guess is not, to be honest with you. You, In my opinion, like I don't want to I don't want to have a guy. I don't want to tell a guy to throw at somebody. And then it gets away from him, hits him in the head, and now we've got suspensions. I don't want to lose a guy over something stupid like this. I, I'm all in on the fans doing what they're doing, and, and I'm good uh, with what the Bronx fans have done so far. Man, good for them to finally kind of get this opportunity uh, this year now with fans back in the building. All right, Bags, what is going on with all of the no hitters in Major League Baseball? Wednesday night, John Means of the Baltimore Orioles threw the third no hitter already this year we're just a month into the season and means goes nine innings no hits no runs no walks doesn't this start to sound like it should have been a perfect game not a no hitter yeah here's the fly in the ointment on the stat line there was a wild pitch strikeout that allowed a batter to reach first base and that is what wiped out the perfect game. I made an argument at work on Wednesday, like maybe that should be considered a perfect game. It's Although not perfect. What are you talking about? And that was very quickly the response I got. Yes. Perfect game is no base runners. Did you did a better reach? You just said a better reach. It's better imperfect. Reach. Yeah. It's an imperfection. Okay. And at least it was on the pitcher too, right? I know. So it, it was it was still a no hitter. So let me just start there okay. because we've talked about it on the show before you and I here. Is the no-hitter overrated? And we only brought that up because of the less-than-household name-brand pitchers who were throwing no-hitters. And here's another one. John Means, 28 years old, drafted in the 11th round in 2014 by Baltimore. Never heard of him. No. But, man, is he having a good year. I'm going to show you his numbers in a second here, how well he's pitched in 2021. 
what is up with these no-hitters? Okay, so the weird thing for me that stands out about the no-hitters is that all three of them this year have been sort of in that could be, like you're saying, that perfect game variety, even though they're not, because there were no walks as well in any of the three. The first two, remember, only one base runner had reached, and it was on hit by pitch in each of the first two occasions. Now we have a guy reaching on a strikeout, which is a Mets fan who, who recently lost the game by giving up two runs on one strikeout, and they lost <laughs> two to one. Uh, it, it's bizarre to think that that could happen. But to your point about the no-hitters, again, I think they're not overrated because this is about one game. So any one person can do it, even if it isn't a household name. We're not putting a, a stock into a no-hitter like we are a season like Jacob DeGrom, right, or like a Cy Young type of thing. It is what it is. It's one game, and I think we rate it as one game. So in that sense, it's not overrated. It's one game. It's one performance that stands out. And, look, you can never take that away from this guy, but, yeah, it doesn't make him a Hall of Famer. They are fun, aren't they? They are. I mean – you know, when I, when we saw the alert on Wednesday in the newsroom, hey, Bags, there's a no-hitter. And and you almost just don't care who or what or, you know, it's, okay, where are they in the game? There was one out in the ninth. We flip it over to MLB Network. John Means has the no-no against the Mariners. Who? Where's he from? Start looking him up. How long has he been in the majors? And then you take another little dive on John Means and you see these numbers from him this year. Ooh, okay. 4-0. and oh. 137 ERA. Look at the whip. Look at the strikeouts per nine. I mean, he has been unbelievable. Now, if you don't know the name John Means, and, and Sean and I have openly admitted we did not know John Means. He was an all-star in 2019 with Baltimore. You don't in worry about the record, but he had, a, had an ERA under 3-3. He was a really good pitcher in 2019. So this is not his first impressive kind of run through six starts or so. Uh, John Means is a good pitcher. I think what what's deceiving about him is he doesn't blow people away. He no. lives in the low to mid nineties. He he is a throwback to, I'll steal a page out of my fandom here, Glavin and Maddox and those guys who just manipulated the strike zone and moved in and out and up and down as opposed to here it is as hard as I can throw it, dare you to hit it kind this of. This is one of the favorite things of mine that you do on this show. You make a point, and it's a good one. And then you immediately make the counterpoint to yourself. <laughs> you said this guy essentially is a nobody. He's one of these guys in this in this discussion of no hitters who's a guy you've never really heard of. And then you turn around and you say, no, wait a minute. This guy actually is a good pitcher. So maybe the no hitter is indicative of that as opposed to just being a random occurrence. Which is it? Look, if you're in the majors, you have to be you have to be on some level of good. The the point that we've made about no hitters is they aren't often thrown by Hall of Famers. They aren't often thrown by multi All Stars. That's that's my point. Is Joe Musgrove's a good pitcher, but Joe Musgrove isn't going to the Hall of Fame right. as much as we love him as a former Valley Cat. But when Joe Musgrove throws a no hitter with fourteen strikeouts, you're like, does this seem to kind of add up? He's a good pitcher, but you wouldn't ever expect that out of him. That's my point. And yeah, look, and it's not to say that. Uh, Hall of Famers can throw no hitters. I mean, Nolan Ryan threw a few. Seven so, of them. Yeah, seven. So it can it can happen certainly, but it is about the one game, right? And th that's really what it is. It's a it's a single performance where you are, I guess, literally unhittable for that day. And that's why, as a fan, you know, you're just drawn to that. It doesn't matter who it is, what city it's in, who the opponent is. When you hear no hitter alert, like like you said last night, you, see, you announced it in the newsroom, and I said, yeah, through how many? Because sometimes it'll be like somebody's got it through six or whatever. Right. And you, I right. think there's one out in the ninth. And all of a sudden, it's gather around the TV, flip on MLB Network, and see if he gets it. And you immediately start rooting for the guy. Unless it's against your team, you want to see that no-hitter. Because despite the fact we've had three of them very early in this season, it is a difficult thing, obviously, to accomplish. I mean, look how long the Mets went in their franchise history before they ever got one. And even that one wasn't really, because it was a fair ball down the line against Santana. Um, so... Look, it's not an easy thing to do, and it's something you want to see because it is that great one-game accomplishment. It's like if a guy is going off in basketball, right, you want to tune in like, wait a minute, is Curry sure. or somebody has like 40 in, in what quarter? Like, I better turn this on to see what happens. It's similar in that, again, not indicative of an overall career, but in that one game, it's something you just have to see. You have to sit down and watch it.
is there anything that halts production in our newsroom, like a, a, a moment in a sporting event? I'm waiting to know what starts the production in the newsroom, <laughs> especially when it comes to us two knuckleheads. But no, you're right. If it's a sporting event, look, I don't care. If it's a tight game, you could have some Division three women's college basketball game on. If you're like, hey, it's a one-point game with t- 10 seconds left, final right. possession. Yeah, I want to see if they hit the buzzer beater, right? There's no doubt. Yeah. yeah. Thankfully, there aren't uh, like 24-hour monitoring cameras in the newsroom to see us just kind of all like – momentarily pause it stuff to watch it and then go back to work. Okay, fine. It was, it was that moment like, Hey, is, somebody's got a no hitter. Now let's find out exactly who it is and how deep we are into the game. But, but yeah, that is it. I mean, speaking of, by the way, we are at live at Alpen house RV in Amsterdam. Uh, we're going to be at an Alpen house location in the capital region once every month here on Honorado Bagnardi. Our thanks to uh, the entire family, at Alpen House for helping us out here on Honorado and Bagnardi being our title sponsor. You know what's cool about this place, man? Like when you go to a car dealership, right? If you want a Chevy, you got to go to Chevy. You want a Ford, you got to go to Ford. You want a Toyota, you got a Toyota dealership, right? Like if you want literally anything under the sun, any kind of RV, any make and model, you can come here, right? Isn't that kind of unique with RVs where it's like you go out in that lot, which is a massive lot. It's literally like the pick of the litter, which is really cool because there's just so much variety. And my, my parents are big campers. So I'm, I, I understand the RV game a little bit and it's like, how many slide outs does that one have? And what, you know, so it's fun to, to be here because the variety, it's literally anything that you can find online or whatever. You can come here and get it, which is really cool. All right. So bags is a little bit of an expert as we're learning here on the show. We're going to put bags into would you call it a camper? Yeah, it's a camper. We're going to put bags into a camper this morning, and we're going to get his grade on it. What does Shawnee think of the camper that Alpen House has set up for him today to do part of the show? We'll get Bags's grade on that. Uh, Jeff Casey, yep, congrats to me and that. Thank you very much, buddy. Appreciate that. Speaking of an unproductive work week, this, this has felt like the NCAA tournament for me. Like planning a wedding. Okay, has probably been the most unproductive work week of my life in a lot of ways. You planned a wedding in a pandemic. Yeah. Which is something that really in the grand scheme of things, hopefully, uh, very few people are going to be able to say, right? And that's something you're going to always look back on and be like, man, remember we had to push that back a year and make all those adjustments. Yeah. Um, so you are finally at the finish line, man. Congratulations. Thank you, buddy. Um, All right, let's keep this show rolling here. We had a really good conversation with Kelly Cruel, who covers both the Hawks and the Braves. You did. I was unavailable, but you had a very good conversation. Somehow, right. I'm planning a wedding, right, (laughs) this week with Ashley, Yeah. and you're the one who's unavailable. How does that happen? I don't know, but what will be nice for our viewers is they're so used to seeing you and me. Now it'll be you and somebody much better looking than me. So look forward to that, viewers. Well, let me tell you something. That isn't difficult (laughs) to do. Uh, Kelly Krull, who covers the Hawks and Braves for Bally Sports South. We're going to talk Herder. We're going to talk Anderson with somebody who gets to see and talk to these guys each and every day. Hang on, that's next on Honorado and Bagnardi. Nutrition is 80% of a healthy lifestyle. With four locations in the 518, Bold has you covered. Delicious? I think that's a yes. It's never been easier or more affordable to eat healthy. Salads with 17 dressings to choose from. Acai bowls with unlimited toppings. Power grain bowls, oatmeal, smoothies, artisan toasts, and Belgium waffles. Live Bold seven days a week. At work, home, or on the go. Dine in, grab and go, pick up or delivery. Live bold, eat bold. And now, back to Honorado and Bagnardi. Brought to you by Alpen House. Kelly Cruel covers both the Braves and the Hawks, where, of course, our guys, Ian Anderson and Kevin Herter, are doing big things on the biggest stage possible. Bally sports reporter Kelly Cruel is with us here on Honorado and Bagnardi. Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time. It's it's good to see you, and, and I can't wait to get the perspective of somebody who's around our two locals as, as much as you are. First off, how are you? 
Yeah, doing great. Staying really busy as naturally the NBA and now MLB are overlapping and I'm getting to see Kevin one day and then the next day it's Ian Anderson. So I'm really glad you had me on here to talk about them and I'm, I'm thrilled I can do this because it's a lot of fun to uh, get to interact with both of them and, and the area should be very proud of what they're doing in Atlanta. Yeah, there's no doubt the Capital Region is. Uh, let's start with the Hawks because yeah. they're in playoff positioning and I grew up a diehard Braves fan. I still am. Let's push Atlanta <laughs> towards over the 500 mark. That would be nice. Okay. Uh, but let's let's start with the Hawks here and what Kevin's doing. Back from injury, mm -hmm. shoulder sprain. Uh, can you give us a sense of maybe just how serious that was? I only know he missed a couple of games, but you spoke with him recently. How's he feeling? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, and up to that point, Kevin had been the most reliable player they had had. He had started every single game. Well, not started every single game, but he had been playing in every single game up to that point. And I, I should mention that, you know, when I say starting, Kevin's been um, – you know, the hybrid for them. If, if he needed to start, he did. If they needed him to come off of the bench, he did. And he's been doing that and he's been consistent in what he's brought to the floor really night in and night out. So that shoulder sprain, when he went and grabbed that, mm. I, I think Fox fans were thinking, uh, well, I know they were thinking, oh my gosh, another one because injuries, unfortunately, has been the headline for that team all season long. And that's what Kevin talked about after missing a couple games. He's back. He felt good. He felt healthy. He didn't feel like the range of motion was um, altered in any sort of way. And that um, at this point, he's the minutes restrictions have been lifted and they'll be able to uh, use him uh, however they need to. And again, he's just been uh, such a consistent factor for them. And you love seeing what he's doing, especially when he gets an opportunity from behind the arc to really have a moment, spot up and knock him down because he's knocked down some big big uh, triples for them and, and moments where they desperately needed them. And I think he, for a guy who's been here with this organization now for a few years, he, he even said the message right now is different than it has been in years past. In years past, it was, okay, guys, let's finish the season strong and have some momentum going into next season. And now it's not, let's finish this season strong with next season in mind it's this season and playoffs in a place that they haven't been to in quite some time and and you can see he's taking a lot of pride in that as he should he's been a big part of it I know Kevin greatly respects Lloyd Pierce and 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 we've talked to him here up in Albany as well um sometimes just a change of voice seems to do something to a team not to say that this team wasn't good and obviously they've had injuries all year long what is it, though, about what Nate McMillan maybe has brought through his prior experiences as a head coach in this league that has really benefited this group? That's really what it is. Um, it, it's the resume of, of a coach who's been around a long time and done this and taken teams to the playoffs before. And, and like you said, sometimes it's just a different voice, basically reiterating the same message but in a slightly different way and these guys have really responded to it and really responded to Nate McMillan and uh, you could see the body language change right away but I also think it needs to be noted that they did get healthy within a game or two of of Lloyd Pierce you know, being removed and Nate being moved into that interim head coach position. Um, they, they got Bogdan Bogdanovich back and he's what he does for that starting lineup and the way he and even Kevin can play off of one another, you know, because for a while there, Kevin was having to kind of run the point alongside Trey when he was down. And so, again, they have asked Kevin to do so many different things this year, and he really um, has has excelled in every which way. And I think we've seen him take that next step and his – growth and in his career and to have a guy like Nate McMillan coaching him up. And I think another thing that I've watched Nate do that I think has been really interesting is just kind of the sets he's added in for certain guys and very little has been altered because in the middle of the season, especially with such a little practice, uh, you can't do a whole lot, but he has added a few sets here and there. And I think we've seen some of the minutes and rotate rotations change slightly. And I'm also noticing when the timeouts are called, how these guys react and at what point in the game they're being called, what that means as far as momentum, stopping the bleeding, turning things around. And so I think guys, especially like Kevin, who are still very early on in their career are realizing, okay, you know, th these are some of the things I need to be aware of. We need to be aware of as a team. And um, just little things like that can make such a huge difference. 
You talked a little bit there about Kevin's growth and maybe confidence. Uh, we saw that when he was at Maryland. His freshman year, he, he really deferred. There were more ball-dominant guys on that team by sophomore year. And Kev told us you know, that Mark Turgeon came to him and said, I need you to be an aggressive scorer. Um, what have you noticed about whether may, maybe he has said something or somebody around him has said it, um, or just his body language in general that has maybe changed this year about him? Yeah, it's funny. Poor Kevin must have been told that his whole career, I'm guessing, <laughs> because that's exactly what he's being told now, even at this level, is when you step in the game for a while, you know, he was starting for a while last year. This no. year, had they had Bogdan Bogdanovich healthy and all these things, he would have been coming off the bench, likely, and did for a while. Then he needed to be in the starting lineup again. And I think that in a way, without even knowing it, changes a guy's mindset a little bit. When you're coming off the bench, you're coming off the bench for instant offense. And being aggressive has to be part of that. Yeah. When you're a starter, you can kind of get a feel for the flow of the game. Like we see some of the best players in the league, right? Get a flow for it, and then all of a sudden they're going off in the third quarter, in the fourth quarter, because they've got it. Kevin's still learning that a little bit, and you can tell, but being aggressive – at any point, whether he's starting or coming off the bench, I think is something he is now very cognizant of. And you see him trying to work his way into the offense early, whether that is with the starting lineup or coming off the bench. And so he's still hearing it and he is taking those steps though. You can see it like he, you know, he gets the ball and you see him right away, drive to the rack, drive to the hole. And, and I think that's his way of being like, okay, this is me starting my own engine and I can do this. I can create offense even with the best players in the world. I, like I have a place here. And so I yeah. think he's kind of figured that out now in this year a little bit. All right, last thing on Kev, can you settle this for us? Uh, okay. Is there an official Is there an official nickname? Is he Red Velvet to the team? He has said when he plays well, it's Kevon instead of Kevin. <laughs> what, what are we calling him? Yeah, that You know, that is the hardest part about not getting to be around the team in huddles right now and in practices because we're still doing the Zoom COVID um, way of, of, of reporting right now. But I wish I could put an end to that <laughs> argument. All I know is that we use Red Velvet a lot. And so the best part, one thing I do want to just um, praise Kevin a little bit about is so we get Vince Carter on our broadcasts um, with Hawks and Vince naturally played with Kevin. Kevin's one of his absolute favorites. You can tell just by the way he speaks about him. Uh, I, my understanding is they still go golf together a little bit when when they can. Um, and even Ian Anderson came along for one of those um, golf outings, which is a funny story um, that apparently goes like, Ian wasn't told Vince was going to be part of this group and he shows <laughs> up and Ian's like, dude, man, that's Vince Carter. And he's like, yeah, that's my, you know, that's my teammate, which I love that about these two, because you think about it, there's somebody that's a everyday text for Ian Anderson right now that Kevin Herter's thinking, man, right. you're texting with Freddie Freeman. Right. Like, so cool. Meanwhile, you know, Ian's over here like, that's Vince Carter. We're golfing with <laughs> Vince Carter today. And he just saw me be awful. Apparently, Ian didn't have a great round. But all that to say, I've heard Vince Carter use my man Red Velvet. So if that puts anything to rest, I'd say VC calls him Red Velvet, but also probably Kev and whatever the Kevon is. So. Yeah, he's know. going to be a Hall of Famer. I'll, I'll take his word for it. That works for me, too. Yeah. Um, all right. On on the Braves side of things, yeah. uh, and I mentioned to you, I, I grew up a diehard Braves fan. I still am. Tom Glavin was my guy. That's how I got hooked in on, on Atlanta. So when Anderson gets drafted by the Braves, we were there as a TV station to cover the draft in New yeah. Jersey. And the buzz started building that day. Hey, I think the Braves are going to take him at three. You got to be kidding me. There's no, and it just worked out that way, which was very cool. And so now, of course, you've got a bunch of Braves fans in the 518. Um, what is it about Ian's makeup that makes you think this guy's going to be able to stick around in the majors for a long time? Because it's still only 12, 13 career starts in the regular season. Yeah, and I want to go back because I want to hear more of your story about that draft day because also then I think it's so interesting to me how that happened for him. And then it's a few years later that Kevin is sitting around thinking, I could end up in Atlanta. And I want to know if you were there for that too because that night had to have been something just remarkable for, for the families that, that follow one another and, and are part of the same cheering blocks for each of these guys. But when you ask about makeup with Ian, it's – there are so many things that I would I would point to to say this is why he'll stick around. But uh, first and foremost, 
his competitive drive and his ability to be poised and find composure in big moments as young as he is, because he doesn't really have that experience to lean back on. And what that says to me, and I think others who probably have followed, you know, sports for a long time, is that when young athletes in the biggest moments of their career can find composure, can find a way to be poised, even when things aren't going well, like Anderson pitching last year in the, in the NLCS, prior to that, the NLDS. These are moments that the team hadn't even been through in a while, much less mm. in Anderson, who's being asked to pinch, pitch against the best at that point. And he went out there and and really, um, you wouldn't have known it was different from just a, an April start for him early in the year. And um, all of that to go along with just the the, the character that, that he has, I, we've gotten to speak numerous times and just always enjoy my conversations because he's very low key, but low key funny. And um, he doesn't mind being authentic and genuine, which is also kind of hard, I think, for young guys early on in their career because they are still finding themselves and they're still finding out where they fit with a team that has superstars like mm -hmm. Freddie Freeman's and uh, Ronald Acuna Jr.'s and the Dansby Swanson's who've been doing this for a few years. And Ian has to play that or walk that fine line of, I know I know, I can be a star, but I, I, I still have to, I have to earn that and I have to earn my place here. And he he's done that very seamlessly. And I know he is certainly um, one of the favorites down here for the media, just because he's, he's always he always makes himself available, first of all. Um, and, and he's remained incredibly humble despite a pretty quick rise to the top. Sometimes you just want to give them one of these. Like, are you are you alive? I, I mean, both of these guys, Anderson and Herder, oh, and really, yeah, it's, it's remarkable. And and it was funny. Again, I got to do this really fun conversation with having both of them on a Zoom call and having them go back and forth and let's talk about their high school years and 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 this and that. But it was it was Kevin who kind of looked at Ian and was like, "Man, and you've." All, you've played in these big games and you're, you know, like selling on this huge stage. And right away, Ian stops him and was like, man, you're right there too. You're right. It was like, Kevin was almost, um, I don't want to say downgrading what he had done, but almost like looking at Ian as you've done so much more than me at this point. And, and Ian was really quick to say, eh, pump the brakes. You're right there with a playoff team this year. It just so happened that last year with me, you know, our team was already there at that stage. And, and I, I, I just think it is really such an awesome story and, and the way that they um, cheer one another on, yeah. um, continue to support each other, continue to stay in touch. So during COVID, I, I might have mentioned this, but during um, all that was going on last season, obviously no fans in the stands. So Ian makes his major league debut in Atlanta and family can't be there like normal right. and all this stuff. But the Braves went out of their way and in a safe way to make sure Kevin Herter was there. And he got to be in a suite and be there for Ian on the biggest day of his career to this point, if you think about it. Now, granted, it's been awesome now in this year to see Ian go back to Yankee Stadium and have Grandma Bev in the stands and the whole family there. I just loved it. But at the same time, there Kevin is across the way playing in the garden against the Knicks. And I'm thinking, these poor guys, usually Kevin's family would have been at the, the, the Yankee right. Stadium. They got to split. The families have to split root on their own boys, but yet there they are just whatever that is, 10 miles apart, the stadiums and the arena and the stadium. And I think just how cool, how how um, unique and special. And it really is um, a wonderful story. And, and to, to young athletes still early in their careers that you can't help but root for. Yeah, now Bob Anderson's on TV crying. Karen has to take over the interview <laughs> for him. <laughs> that, that interview, the one thing I was told before that interview by Ian, nonetheless, my mom, does not want to talk to you. Okay. Like not that she doesn't want to like speak to you beforehand in this yep. She just didn't want to be on camera speaking. And I was like, Hey, I totally understand. I get that. I've done a lot of family interviews. I know there's usually one parent or whatever. I think about my own parents in that situation. And my dad would not be the one talking. Mom <laughs> would take over. Right. But, but so Bob was supposed to be the one. And I, you know, it's great, Bob, here's what I'm going to ask you ahead of time. And then we got going and I could see it right away. And for me, the moment I see dad, and I know dad's not probably as well as you do, but I know dad's history of how long he's coached and coaching yeah. his son and how many 
teams he's taken to state titles. And so you know how much he's invested in the game and certainly his own son. And, and watching this moment, I knew it was going to choke him up a little bit. But I thought he's got a like kind of tough rough side to him too, though. I thought he would hold it together. And when he started losing it, I knew I was losing it. And then I knew I wasn't supposed to turn to mom. And there Bob is like, let her take over. And I was like, I don't think I'm supposed to do that, Bob. I like but right away, Karen was kind of like, I mean, she could feel the moment and, and she kind of leaned into me, giving me that acknowledgement of, I, you know, I can do this. Like, I can help us through this. And um, I, I just I feel grateful that I get to do things with families like that in moments like that and share it because that's I'm sure for you, too. That's the best part of this job. It was so cool to see. Yeah, so cool to see. And you're right. I mean, the herders. Flew to Texas with the Andersons last year for the yep. playoffs. It what Kevin and Ian told you is spot on that they are attached at the hip, really cheering each other on. It's a very, very cool thing to see. It is, it is. And 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 nowadays with uh social media too, I love when one's tweeting out <laughs> the other part and this one's tweeting out how he's like, like I mean the funny part the funny parts about that that interview were, were like going back to high school i jokingly just wanted to know you know what was hey ian what was what was kevin herter's batting stance like what did he look like when he was hitting and the way they'd like play off one another but then before they were done sort of ragging on each other they totally bring it back to but this is how awesome of an athlete and person and human being and now what he's doing on his own stage and they they would pay off you know after giving each other a little bit of a jab or two but i, I think my favorite story from that had something to do with like a ninth grade tournament baseball tournament that they were in of course they traveled together aau ball and or baseball and they were in some tournament and this i'm pretty sure this was like eighth or ninth grade and um they lost in the beginning and went into sort of this loser's bracket and then of course you have to go all the way through and you might at the end be able to play against again the winner's bracket and they, they go through and have to win i think they said something like three baseball games in a day or something like this. And they end up winning, of course, all of them yep. get to the end. And I guess they bumped into this team they're playing and this team they're playing is like, ah, we got no, nobody left, no starters left. And I guess they were like, yeah, neither do we, neither do we. And at that point they had been holding on to Ian, but Ian wasn't really at that point. Uh, this must have been ninth grade because he was not yeah. yet one of their like starters quite yet. But I think they all saw and knew just how good he could be even at that age. So they hadn't used him and they decided to use him in this game. And then they go through and end up winning the entire tournament. And it, all because of like Ian and Kevin was like, our poker faces were so good <laughs> even in eighth grade. We had them fooled. And I was like, you guys are hysterical. I mean, they really are. And they, and they just... I, I I have such a good time talking to both of them. And I just, um, you know, you really do. You, you root for them and you hope that both of them can stay healthy and continue on with really, really successful careers and enjoy watching one another grow. And I'll let you go on this. Ian has told stories about how they used to hustle the other out-of-town baseball teams at the hotel with a basketball court. Like, yeah, we're not that good. Meanwhile, Herder's just lighting everybody up. Of course, that yeah. sounds about right. I got I got to get on some of those stories. I want to hear those too. But yeah, I mean, it just um, how how tough to be so good at so I many know. sports, right? I know. It's awful, and we're pretty, isn't it? understand, pretty darn good um, students as well back in that day. So I mean, that's that's a lot to balance, and you can tell um, all of those things that they were doing even then they, they're they're still same guys just a little more grown up it was I think it was Kevin who said something like I, I might have asked like so what you know what was it that you guys did when you weren't playing sports and he was like well we weren't really invited to parties and such. <laughs> <laughs> we just hung out with each other and he brought up Ian's twin brother right yeah. and he's like to this day my mom needs them side by side because she's not even sure sometimes it's remarkable how much they still look alike. And if they call, apparently if they call on the phone, their voices sound exactly alike. So, so <laughs> Kevin's like, I can tell, but even the closest to family members still have a hard time sometimes because, but we had our own little group in high school and clearly it's worked out for them. <laughs> That's funny. And we should show Ben, Ian's twin yeah. brother, some love in the Rangers organization. Think about yeah. it. Now you got three who are pros and, 
you know, Ben certainly is is as talented as as the rest of them for sure. Uh, Kelly, thank you so much for the time. This has been a lot of fun and yes. it's great perspective from somebody who gets to, to be around these guys, even just through Zoom calls uh, on a daily basis. So thank you so much for the time. We really appreciate it. Well, I really appreciate you asking. It's been fun to talk about them and they're doing big things down here. Happiness is found in simple things. The sun on your face, sharing laughs, at the campground, getting wet, relaxing together, the love of family. There's never been a better time to go outside and play. Alpenhouse Pool Spa Boat and RV, bringing families together and creating memories since 1964. Teams. Athletes, organizations, we're transforming the custom apparel industry through product and purpose. Claim your crown. And now, back to Honorado and Bagnardi. Brought to you by Alpen House. All right, bags. Boy, you've changed locations, man. You finally away from me a little bit. I, I'm I'm thankful for that. Uh, you are live from an Alpen House camper and we are in Amsterdam and we put bags uh, in one of their great campers for a little look around here but I've got I've got a couple of comments here I want to share really quickly Shawnee before we do that and we were talking about yes my wedding this weekend and Carol who is such a devoted viewer of ours and we thank her every time she weighs in on the conversation here she says hopefully you only do it once Here we go. How Better. We, now, listen. Better. It's my first show. Uh, listen, here's my thought on this. You will only do it once. Ashley, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, right. Lucky enough for the stars to align somewhere in our universe that, yes, somebody might actually say yes to me to uh, potentially spend the rest of their lives with me. So, yeah, you say only once for me. We'll see about Ash. I, you know what? Look, I think that's fair. I think right. that's fair. You ready for the tour here, brother? Yeah, please. So I am in the Imagine. That's what the name of this camper is, the Imagine. What I love about campers, Chris, mm -hmm. is their ability to put so much in such a small space, right? You've got everything in such a small space. Not that this is a small camper, but check this out, man. Over here, you got, you got your bunks, right? Yep. So you got... Some company, you got room for two people there, or I don't know, four or five people, depending on however you want to do it. Here's your seating area. Nice bench seating like that. with the yeah. You got your television over here, which is great. Oh. This kitchen is awesome, man. You got literally everything. Get your microwave here. Check this out. You got oven, sink, everything. And now over here, we got the refrigerator. See what I mean? It's all in such a compacted area, but they do such a great job utilizing the space. Dude, check out the size of this bed. I'm 6'4". I can fit comfortably in this bed. And look, at this is my favorite feature here. Look at this little light above the bed. Look at that. A little night light, blue light. And then you got your regular light if you want it. So very impressive. Come out to Alpen House. Get yourself and imagine and uh, imagine the possibilities with you out in the woods in this thing with literally all the comforts of home. What more could you want? That was that was well done. Uh, you're not going to be a spokesperson anytime soon, I don't think, or maybe a slogan writer. But but well done still. Um, haven't you always wanted to just like tour the country and stop at ballparks along the way? Yeah, dude, and and a camper would be the way to go because, like I said, it's all the comforts of home. You don't have to get a hotel everywhere you go. You park this thing, you plug it up, you plug it into power and sewer, and you're good to go. All right, I like this idea. Here you go, bags. Before we leave today, get my wedding gift right here. Oh, okay. Cow. 
That's Nick says one of those idea. campers would be a nice. Yeah, it, it would be. That's for sure. How about this one? I like this comment. John Conlon, bigger than his first apartment. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the thing is, man, it's nice too. Like it's updated appliances. It's up to like, th look at these cabinets. Like that's, if you're going to put cabinets like that in your house, that's going to cost you yep. pretty penny. So like I said, all the comforts of home, man, I love it in here. This is great. I might stay in here every show. <laughs> Please do. Don't come out anytime soon, okay? Just hang out in there. All right, here's one funny thing I saw, and we'll get to the Aaron Rodgers thing happening in Green Bay. We've got NBA to get to on the show here as well. But, Bags, I saw this early in the week, and I thought, how great is my home state? New Jersey has an offer out there. If you get your vaccination shot, you will get a free beer at a participating brewery. New Jersey is doing it right, man. Yeah, but, Chris... You have to understand they clearly missed an opportunity here. Oh, right. This is great. How do you not go get a shot, get a shot? Because know, bags, when you I go, know you're gonna go say to it's more expensive, and they're I get that, but that's an opportunity. No, this is a this is a fail by you. You're you're failing to understand that people walk up to a bar and they say, Give me a shot and a beer. That's an order at a bar is a shot and a beer. You get the shot, you then maybe a beer alongside it. That's how people order things sometimes is a shot and a beer. Mm. See, yeah, I, think, I think they just don't want to have to shell out. No. Liquor every, every shot. I get a shot and a shot. Give me two shots. <laughs> that's, what, that, that's what we're all after these days is two shots. Yeah, right. And, and in all seriousness, man. I'm, I'm for anything that encourages people to go out and get vaccinated. I mean, that's ultimately what's bringing us closer to the end of this pandemic. So any kind of incentive that anybody, any state, any business wants to do, I'm for that, man. All right, Chris Honorado and Sean Bagnardi here on Honorado and Bagnardi. If you know me, you know my allegiance to the Packers. I was a diehard Brett Favre fan. That hurt when he just came back as a member of the Vikings and pounded Green Bay twice that season after the Jets. I just can't imagine, Bags, that I'm not going to see Aaron Rodgers finish his career with Green Bay, but this possibility is all too real for me now. With each day that passes, the momentum grows towards Rodgers getting what he wants, and that is out of Green Bay. I don't know that a longer contract more money, more say over personnel decisions, even firing the general manager, Brian Gutenkust, is going to be enough to get Rodgers to stay. And quite frankly, I'm starting to stress over it. I'm going to be on my honeymoon, and I don't need this occupying some of my mental space. But I know that it's going to every morning bags. I wake up and I think, is there anything new on Rodgers? And now I know. One quick thing. June 1st is the date we all need to be on the watch out for because that's when Green Bay can trade him after June 1st and not incur such a, a cap hit. So nothing will happen before June 1st. I'm confident of that. But from June until kickoff of the season, I will be sweating bullets over this one. Well, you're very selfish to be thinking about this on your honeymoon. Uh, that's very unfair to Ashley. I'm doing a show on the honeymoon. <laughs> that's a good point. You'll be hanging out with me instead of her when you're in Hawaii. That's that's pretty bad. Um, what is Rodgers – what's most important, do you think, to Aaron Rodgers right now in his career? Is it winning another Super Bowl? And if it is, 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 this, is this part of that? Or is it not winning a Super Bowl? Is something else more important to him, you think, since he does at least have his one? Aaron Rodgers is a complicated guy, so I'm going to give you a complicated answer. I think there are three things that are, if possible, equally important to Aaron Rodgers. One is winning another Super Bowl. Two is feeling like he is kind of being given the respect he feels he has earned, and I feel he has earned it as well. I think he wants respect, right? R-E-S-P-E-C-T, Rodgers wants some of that. And then thirdly, I think he's just kind of interested in like, you know what this feels like? This feels a lot like LeBron James, the Lakers. It feels like Rodgers wants to set himself up with whatever the next franchise or team is for him to then be successful post playing. Everybody jumps to jeopardy and that's fine. But it's also his fiance, who's a very successful actress. 
how can I get somewhat closer maybe to L.A. where, yes, they film Jeopardy. Yes, my fiance, soon to be wife, is an actress uh, and does all of her shoots. If this feels like LeBron to the Lakers, a move that's bigger than the game in a current spot. And if he gets another championship the way LeBron did, all the more better. So you you would say though, you know, you can't say equally. If you had to give one, you would say maybe the Super Bowl takes a backseat to some of the other things important in his life, whether it be getting that respect or setting himself up for what is about after football. And, and I don't know, that's not the best look. I want Aaron Rodgers to be about winning a Super Bowl more than anything. And look, if that was his mentality, maybe getting out of Green Bay is the right thing, but I don't think it is. To I win. Think- no, this is this is one of the best situations he could be in to win right now. That's my point. I mean, not to say there isn't a better situation, but I think if it was really about winning most, he would want to stay right where he is and be doing what he can to make the relationship as smooth as possible yeah. with the front office and with the organization because ultimately you've got to do it together to get to that ultimate finish line and hoist the Lombardi trophy. How many times will I ask you between now and – let's say kickoff, but maybe late August, is Aaron Rodgers going to play for the Packers this year? A lot, because I think he ultimately will, but I think there'll be questions about it leading right up into it. But at the end of the day, I still have him in a Packers uniform. I like to hear that. I'm not as confident as you. I heard Rob Domofsky, who covers the Packers for ESPN, say earlier in the week, he gives about a 5% chance that Rodgers is back in Green Bay, that it's that bad. That's bad. That's bad, and that's somebody who knows way more than we do about it. But you don't know. You don't really. Nobody really knows what's going on behind the scenes except for Rodgers and the Packers. And some of this is probably gamesmanship. Some of it, like you say, is about that respect and if the Packers show Rodgers the respect that he thinks he deserves, maybe this does turn around. Yeah, I'm, look, I'm still hopeful, obviously, that that uh, the egos will be somewhat put aside. Um, but Rodgers is in the driver's seat. There's no doubt about it. And I know people will look at the other side and say, well, the organization can say, okay, go ahead and retire. Then you won't play. I don't think it's all that easy. All right, when we come back here on Honorado and Bagnardi, we'll wrap things up. We'll go around the NBA quickly. I'm going to throw up a very disturbing stat in Major League Baseball that has me worried about really where this game continues to go. That's next on Honorado and Bagnardi. At Marcella's Appliance Center, our commitment is to you, providing essential appliances that families depend on for cooking, refrigeration, cleaning, and sanitation, plus appliance repair. You can have peace of mind that Marcella's is here for you today and every day, like we have been since 1957, helping you make the right choice with trusted brands like Whirlpool, Maytag, KitchenAid, Gen Air, and many more. Shop Marcella's Appliance Center in-store, online, or by phone. We're here for you. Depressed, overworked, job sucks, underappreciated. When life sucks, <laughs> just say Dilligat. Our clothing line puts the F you back into fun. <laughs> Nothing will give you greater satisfaction. Dilligat isn't just an attitude, it's a lifestyle. Some people ride the crazy train, we drive that mother. Check out our selection at DillaGaffUSA.com. And now, back to Honorado and Bagnardi. Brought to you by Alpenhouse. We are live at Alpenhaus uh, in Amsterdam. Bags, I'm not a downer, but this has me depressed. This is a troubling trend in Major League Baseball. In the month of April, there were more strikeouts than hits to the degree of 1,000, 1,100 more strikeouts than hits. That's depressing. It's the lowest April average since 1968. You know what happened after 1968? Hmm. Baseball decided to lower the mound, to level the playing field between pitcher and batter, and yet we've had a lower average in April since 68. And then starting pitching bags are starting pitchers are only lasting 4.8 innings per well, start. Personally, I look at this and I blame Chili Davis, the Mets hitting coach. 
Mm, you should. Um, okay. No, listen, seriously. It does speak to a big problem with the game. And when we had Brian Kenny on the show about a year ago, one of the things he talked about that's really hurting baseball is the lack of balls in play, right? It's either right. Uh, obviously a home run is in play, but if you're going to play in a strikeout or a home run league, and if certainly it's going to lean more toward the strikeout, then you miss an awful lot of action at the ballpark. You miss, we already know they don't run the bases the same way they used to. They don't try to steal bases. So now you're missing plays at bases. You're missing guys trying to stretch doubles into triples. You're, you're missing a lot of action yep. of the game that makes a, a slow and linear game more boring than it is, which hurts baseball in the long run. So yes, for as big of fans as we are of the game, I'm with you. It's not exactly heading the best direction. I don't know that doing things to give pitchers uh, less of an advantage than they already have is the answer, but something's got to be done, man, because these numbers are not good. Yeah, it, it is. It continues to go in the wrong direction. I know the the commissioner's office is trying a few things here and there. Uh, it is not working yet. It certainly is not working yet. All right, how about in the NBA bags? Uh, the Knicks continue to get it done. Julius Randle continues to play at an elite level. We had Andy Heck, who's one of the owners here at Alpenhouse. He's playing like an MVP. What, are, what argument did I try to make a couple weeks ago? He should be maybe considered for MVP. So people who are Knicks fans are understanding the impact of Julius Randle as they sit in that four spot. They're certainly not going to be part of the play-in tournament, which is good news for the yep. Knicks, and they might even host a playoff series. Exactly. That's the key right now, four versus five. You're playing that same team. The difference is who gets to host, and I think it is important as we're talking about more fans going back into arenas the Garden crowd could be the difference in a potential first-round series with the Atlanta Hawks, for instance. A lot of people are saying, hey, the Knicks can beat the Hawks, and they certainly can. But you know Atlanta, who's playing pretty well also, is sitting there saying the same thing about the Knicks. Hey, that's a team we can actually go out and beat and, and get to the second round and take on probably the number one seed in the Eastern Conference in the second round. So I'm watching the Knicks down the stretch. I'm watching Brooklyn to see if James Harden gets healthy because they need the big three. Yes. Do you have concerns with Brooklyn? My concern after seeing them lose two games against the Bucks very recently is that they need the big three to win. James Harden was the difference in their lone win against the Bucks this year. Giannis is playing at a high level, and he's making some outside shots, which makes him a very dangerous threat in the postseason, more than he normally is. Another team I'm watching right now down the stretch, too, Chris, is the Washington Wizards. I know they're way down in the Eastern Conference, but the way Russell Westbrook is playing and the way they are playing collectively – they're going to be dangerous if they come out of that play-in tournament for a one or two seed to try to have to deal with. They probably have to be the number one seed who they'd end up playing, and I don't want that matchup. I can, I can understand that, but as what do you always say to me in a seven-game series? The best team's going to win. And you do you do math on this in a way to say, do you really think Team X, and in this case X is the Wizards, could beat the Sixers four times? No. So no. I, I, I hear you. It could make for an entertaining series, but it could be an entertaining five-game series, right? I'm with you. Yep, agreed. All right, we've had a lot of fun here live at Alpen House in Amsterdam. Bags, have a great weekend, brother. You too, man. You next week, again, live on location, but from a honeymoon. See you, everybody. <laughs>